Shalom everybody and welcome. My name is Ishai Fleischer and I'm standing right now in the heart of Judea. You know, you may believe that the Jewish people have historical rights or biblical rights to the land of Israel, but when the word international law comes in, you may get a little afraid because the haters of Israel are always using the term international law against Israel. Well, there's actually an amazing and beautiful story of Israel's international law recognition that happened 100 years ago in San Remo, Italy. That's when the Allied powers that were the victors of World War I got together to dismember the lands controlled by the Ottoman Empire and hand them to indigenous local peoples, including the Jews. I'm going to be speaking with some awesome experts, Colonel Richard Kemp from the British Army, Jake Bennett about the text, the legal text of the Mandate for Palestine, and Rabbi Mike Foyer about the spiritual aspect of the recognition of Israel by the international community. So stick with me for a journey that goes back a hundred years to San Remo, Italy, at the beginnings of the recognition of Israel in international law. All right, folks, we are celebrating 100 years since the San Remo Accords, which was the first and, and maybe deepest international recognition of Jewish rights in the land of Israel. And this segment, I am joined by Colonel Richard Kemp. Richard Kemp is a retired British Army officer, served from 1977 to 2006, completed 14 operational tours uh, around the globe. He spent most of his life fighting terrorism and insurgency. Uh, he's commanded British troops on the front lines, including Afghanistan, Iraq, Balkans, and Northern Ireland. Uh, he even chaired an intelligence group, maybe not everybody in the world knows about it, but it's kind of famous in England. It's called the Cobra Intelligence Group, which is responsible for coordinating the work of national intelligence agencies, MI5 and MI6. That's cool stuff. His book, Attack Red State, about war torn in Afghanistan, was a, a Sunday Times bestseller. But for the purposes of this discussion, it's also important to know that Colonel Kemp is an outspoken critic of the international community's stance on Israel and regularly writes and comments on this issue. He's involved with several pro-Israel organizations. I've heard him speak about this many times. And in, the and in a sense, for me, uh, Colonel Kemp is exactly a throwback to those incredible men that lived 100 years ago and desperately wanted to see the reconstituting of the Jewish state in the land of Israel for various reasons, for various reasons. We're going to get right to that in a second. Colonel Kemp, welcome to the show. Yishai, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's really good to be uh, your guest on this. And um, as always, it's great to be talking to you. Even though I can't see you in person, I can see you on the screen. And it's really good. As you pointed out to me just now, you're always a fun guy. So it's a great that's right. pleasure. That's right. That's right. And I, and I love your room back there. It, it really, there's a lot of uh, war type of uh, paraphernalia there. You've really been in battle for, for more than 30 years now with your other battles that you're in. And it reminds me of some of the great generals of the past, for example, General Allenby. And General Allenby is, is leading the British in World War I, pushing back the Ottoman Turks. And he's coming up the coast from Egypt. He's coming up to, to, to Jaffa. He's coming through Gaza. He's fighting there, having a tough fight, coming up to Jaffa. And finally, he's making it up to Jerusalem. And all the while, when he's, when he's in process, there's already... Um, a kind of uh, effort to turn on the idea that the Jewish people are going to be given the opportunity to reconstitute their presence in this land after the British free this land from the Turks. So I kind of wanted to ask you about your perspective on, on 1917, you know, 1960, 1917, those ideas at the time, and that, and that British general who's walking up to Jerusalem, and when he, finally gets off to, when he finally gets into Jerusalem, dismounts his horse in order to give respect to this holy city. The, um, the year 1917, I think, probably was the most single most significant year uh, that led to the recreation of the Jewish state eventually in 1948. Um, and there were two things, really, and you've, you've certainly touched on one of them, and you've also touched to an extent on another one. Two things occurred in 1917, which um, which led to, the, I think, more than anything else, to the recreation of the Jewish state. The first of them was the, the Balfour Declaration, the the British government's policy decision to to encourage uh, and enable the establishment of Jewish national homeland in the then uh, land of Palestine. 
Um, and, and secondly, and, and I think actually at least as important, possibly more important than the Balfour Declaration was the campaign you just spoke about, General Allenby's campaign to throw the Ottoman Empire out of Palestine and other parts of the Middle East um, and, and reconquer it, conquer it for, um, for Britain as part of the war effort. Let's not forget that that campaign was part of a defensive war after the Turks attacked the British in Egypt. Um, so it was a defensive campaign in which the British were victorious. When I say the British, obviously it wasn't just British, 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 it was also Australians, New Zealanders, people from other countries as well, part of the British Empire fighting. Um, and one element of, of that battle, which, which isn't really well known over here, it's probably well known in Israel, but isn't too well known over here, was the, the, the role of uh, Jewish people from Palestine that formed an intelligence group called Nili. And Nili was a fundamental uh, element of General Allenby's success. Without the intelligence that was passed by Nili, um, the Aronson family, um, who were the, the, the sort of backbone of Nili, without the intelligence passed by them, uh, General Allenby's own chief of intelligence uh, has said that he would not have been able to win that conflict uh, in the way he did. Eventually, may, maybe one, but with few, many more casualties and it would have taken longer. So that's the fundamental thing. And the other point I think that we should um, bear in mind when we talk about this subject is that uh, not in 1917, but the next year in 1918, um, when Allenby concluded his campaign and, and threw the Turks completely out of the region, um, a, a fundamental part of that was the Jewish Legion, part of the British Army, the first formed Jewish fighting force since the time of the Maccabees. The 38th, 39th, 40th and 41st battalions of the Royal Fusiliers, collectively known as the Jewish Legion, who were formed by uh, Colonel John Patterson. Uh, in 1917 and actually fought for the first time at um, Megiddo in, in 1918. And those uh, brave Jewish soldiers, many of them came from the UK, many came from Palestine itself, some came from the United States of America, Russia and other countries around the world to, to form this incredible organization that, that played a, a key role in defeating the Turks and of course went on to become in some respects, the founding fathers of the idea. Many of the people that fought in the Jewish Legion, and of course fought later, others, younger ones, fought in the Second World War. Many of them from both of the wars uh, were, were pretty important in, in founding the IDF. And just very briefly, if I may, John Patterson was a, a British-Irish colonel, um, not Jewish, uh, Christian, who after the war, he went to um, live in the United States of America and he died in the USA. He was buried in California and he became a close friend in the US with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, whose father, Benson Netanyahu, who the, the famous Zionist and historian. Um, and he became so close to him that, uh, that he, he asked him to be, I, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm not an expert on um, the Jewish religion, but the equivalent in, in Judaism of a, of a godfather, as we would have it to his oldest son, Yoni, and in fact, his oldest son was named Yoni after John Patterson. Um, and of course, Yoni subsequently became the hero of Entebbe. Uh, and then um, after, the, uh, after when Patterson died, he died in 1947, his wish would be, was, been, was to have been buried among the Jewish soldiers he led in battle in Palestine in 1918. But because of the time, it was 47, as I said, it wasn't possible. But a few years back now, his remains were exhumed from California and reinterred in a Jewish military cemetery where his soldiers had been buried in a ceremony presided over by Prime Minister Netanyahu. And I was very fortunate in being able to be there myself. That's awesome. And that's awesome that you were there. I, I, I forgot the part that you were there. I knew the rest. That must have been a special feeling for you because, you know, uh, the UK... The story of the UK's involvement in the rebirth of the Jewish people is very significant. I have a fabulous book right here, which is called The Balfour Declaration by Elliot Yeager. Great book, by the way, and, and talks about some of the fabulous uh, British people that were involved. Uh, and we'll get to a second what their motivation was. But there's also been dark times. You and I, before the show, discussed that we wouldn't get into it too much. But you're the kind of British person who sees 
uh, the story of Israel as a, a just story, a rightful story. And it must have been very special for you to be at that reinterment of, uh, of General Patterson in the land of Israel, a, a British soldier, by the way, famous for many other things, not just Zionism, including killing these uh, man-eating lions. Uh, and yet he's, you know, he's buried here in Israel. It must have been a special moment for you. It, it, was a, it was an incredible moment. I knew a lot about John Patterson. And of course, I knew a lot about um, many other British military and political leaders who have also been very, very strong supporters of, uh, of Zionism and then later of the state of Israel and, and the Zionism of, of Israel. Um, and, you know, the, coming to mind uh, immediately is um, Ord Wingate, another very famous British officer who um, in the 1930s, again, not Jewish Christian, in the 1930s, he, um, uh, did, you know, on, off, on his own initiative, because of the, the feeling he had for the Jewish people in the land of Israel, he, um, he taught the Jewish farmers and people living in, uh, in the land at the time, he taught them how to defend themselves against marauding Arab bands who were trying to kill them and drive them out back in right. the 1930s. Um, yeah, he was the original like, was, anti-terror trainer. Right, absolutely. And he taught them to not just defend yourself in your village, go out and get the enemy, go out at night, get them, kill them when they're not expecting you and deal with them. And that was, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of his philosophy was became the, the kind of policies that are still used today by the IDF. And in right. fact, David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel, said that had Ord Wingate, remember a British Christian officer, had he not been killed in the Second World War, he was a, he was killed in Burma in the Second War as a general in an air crash, and later buried in uh, Arlington Military Cemetery in Washington. He, um, Ben Gurion, said, had Wingate not been killed in the Second World War, he would have been the first chief of staff of the IDF. So the first chief of staff of the IDF would have been a British Christian officer, which is actually something incredible to think of. But there have been others, you know, obviously people like David Lloyd George, who was the main figure behind the Balfour Declaration, Balfour himself, Winston Churchill. More recently, we had people like Margaret Thatcher, Tony Blair, our current Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. Um, many, many prominent British figures, that perhaps the, the best of our leadership, have always been staunch, strong supporters of, of the Jewish people and of the State of Israel. I just want to mention one other military figure who no one will have heard of, I'm sure, but He's somebody who's quite special to me personally. And he was a guy from my own regiment. Um, I was a member of the Royal Anglian Regiment, um, which was formed from uh, a, a, a number of earlier county regiments, including the Suffolk Regiment. And the Suffolk Regiment during the, uh, the, the period of before Israeli independence was, was based in Palestine, was over there. And they were told, you're moving back, you're going back to Britain. Um, and you know, there's, there's then going to be a war. The Arabs are going to invade, and they were basically told that the Arabs are going to defeat the the Jews in that war. And in fact, Field Marshal Montgomery, the head of the British Armed Forces at the time, he gave I think the the Jewish people just a matter of weeks to hold out after the Arabs invaded. Anyway, one of these guys in the Suffolk Regiment, my regiment, was um, called Ringo Watson. Again, he was a Christian British. I think a corporal or a private at the time, he wasn't a senior officer, wow. but he, he realized what was gonna happen and he was not willing to go back to England and just from a distance watch the Jews getting annihilated. He had to fight, so he deserted. When his regiment went, he stayed illegally. He kept his machine gun with him. He went and joined the, the Haganah and he fought in the Battle of Jerusalem, was wounded in the Battle of Jerusalem, fought throughout the War of Independence. And after the war, he remained in Israel for a while. And then later, he, as, as these things tend to happen, he met a Jewish girl and married her. Um, and, uh, and, and then a bit later on, they decided they would go back to England. He didn't really want to just live as a, a kind of a um, you know, criminal, effectively, for the rest of his life, uh, away from his, his, his own home. So they went back to England. He actually took his machine gun back with him as well, that he'd that he'd taken to fight in the War of Independence. In those days, you could take a machine gun on a plane, um, no doubt, dismantled. But, um, and he handed himself in. He was court-martialed, did a short period in prison, because, you know, if you, go, if, you, if you desert for selfish reasons, that's different. But if you desert to fight, 
then you're looked at a lot more leniently. And so he did a short time in, in military prison and then served on in the British Army together with his wife there. And he became a Sergeant Major and retired just a few years ago, died a few years ago. And he, wow. he, his name was legendary within my regiment, Ringo Watson, John Ringo Watson, his name. No relation to the Beatles, any of the Beatles. <laughs> That's an amazing story. That's, a, that's an amazing story. Now, now, that leads me exactly to my next question. There were various motivations at the time for British support for a Jewish uh, state in, the, in Palestine, in the land of Israel. Uh, they were various. For example, T.E. Lawrence was actually in favor of Zionism as well, really because he was in favor of uh, supporting local peoples to rise up against the Turks, the Ottoman Turks, support the British, be allies to the British. And so he saw the Arabs and the Jews not very differently. He saw, he helped turn the, the Arabs against the Turkish uh, rulers. And so too he said, okay, the Jews are also part of the equation here. They're an indigenous people in this land. They're living here. They could be good for the, for the British empire. And he supported both of those indigenous peoples as, as having self-determination and, and turning, turning against the Turks. That's one very geopolitical reason. Another geopolitical reason was that the UK wanted continued control over the Suez Canal. And the uh, friendly Jewish state, the proto-state, would help them ensure control over the Suez Canal. But then there was one other motivation. There's others, but, but one clear one, which was a love and a connection with the Bible. And you had that with uh, David Lloyd George. You had that with Balfour. Uh, these are people who were steeped in biblical tradition. In, in reading the Bible, uh, Balfour's mother read him the Bible every night, and uh, they, they recognized these places, and they felt that this is their great, and here it also bifurcates into two different rationales. One is the great opportunity to reconstitute the Jewish commonwealth, and another one is to fix some of the wrongs that were perpetrated against Jews by Christendom, and they felt themselves to be emissaries people who could fix a kind of, fix a historical wrong, right a historical wrong by doing this thing. And they were very, very passionate. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about these various motivations of the British Empire at the, at the time, in 1916, 1917, 1920, uh, at, the San, at San Remo, uh, for, for the creation of a Jewish state. Yeah, I mean, there's no, no question at all that, that it, the mo motives were, were varied, including self-interest on the part of the UK. Um, and I should, you know, I should just say again that um, it was really Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, and remember he was fighting a tremendous fight in the First World War. It was, it was certainly not, the, the, the outcome was certainly not um, uh, able to be foretold. It was, there was no absolute definite, uh, you know, prediction that we would be victorious in the First World War. Many, many thousands and thousands of British soldiers, American soldiers later, French uh, were being slayed in the war, as well as Germans, of course. Um, so it was a terrible time. And, you know, I mean, I think the challenges, even even today, challenges faced by, for example, our Prime Minister over here, Boris Johnson, and your Prime Minister there, Benjamin Netanyahu, with the coronavirus thing, I think pale into almost insignificance compared to the, the tremendous challenges he faced. So he was looking for every possible um, way he could have of achieving victory. And... Uh, you mentioned the the the, the desire to uh, maintain control of the Suez Canal. Obviously, very important. But another very important thing was to um, was to, uh, to to keep allies on side and try and harness our allies around the world. And and the Jewish people were seen Jewish people in the United States, I think, in particular, but also elsewhere, were seen as being fundamental to that because they they played in in many cases they played significant roles within their own society. And I think that that was part of the motivation, not, not the whole motivation at all, but part of the motivation for the Balfour Declaration and for, you know, for, for Britain essentially befriending the Jewish people in this way. And I think, um, you know, one thing we shouldn't forget, because people will talk about the Balfour Declaration as a, you know, a, a, an embodiment of British foreign policy, which it was, but it wasn't British alone. Before Balfour made the declaration, he secured the agreement of all of the major countries in the world that we weren't fighting at the time. So that includes um, the United States of America, it includes China, it includes, you know, pretty much every other major power, France and so on, that we weren't actually involved in combating. 
So it wasn't, the Balfour Declaration wasn't just, it was portrayed purely as a, a British political instrument, but it wasn't just that. It was, it was as, and as it was later enshr enshrined in, um, in San Remo, it was, uh, you know, it was an international agreement and he garnered international support for it. But I do agree with you also that um, I'm sure both, you know, Balfour and Lloyd George were both Christians. Uh, and Lloyd George in particular, he was a Methodist from Wales, and he saw a lot of commonality in both the religion and in the nature and character of his own country, Wales, with the, the, you know, the future Jewish state. And so he had, I think he had a great deal of sympathy. And you, you find people like um, Ord Wingate later on, um, and, and John Patterson, these also were religious men, and they were partly motivated by their, the inspiration of the Bible. Uh, and that, that does go for many, I think, many people, many non-Jewish people who are fervent supporters of Israel. Personally speaking, I'm a Christian as well, but my support for Israel is not, I mean, it's, it's obviously, if anything, reinforced by my knowledge of the Bible, which is not as great as it should be, but uh, certainly not as great as people like Old Ringo. But, um, I, I, you know, my, my motivation is not, my personal motivation is not about the Bible. I'm, I'm, I, can, I am a Christian, I am a Zionist, but I don't consider myself a Christian Zionist. In other words, motivated by Christianity. I, 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 you know, a lot of it, a lot of my motivation is knowing right from wrong. And of course, that comes from my Christian upbringing as well. But I, I do recognize um, the, the, first of all, the, the rectitude of the Israeli cause and the wrongness, the, the absolute black wrongness of those people who want to destroy the state of Israel even today, and there are many of them, not only in the Middle East but in the West as well, but also um, the virtue that Israel has for the whole of the world. And you know, I've, I've worked closely with the IDF, with other Israeli state organizations, in, including intelligence services, in my professional career. And I know how much our country, Britain, and also the rest of the Western world, and most of the world itself, and not even outside the West, owes to the state of Israel in terms of, you know, forget about trade and economy, but in terms of just things like uh, technology, military technology, um, medical technology, intelligence. Intel Israeli intelligence has saved so many lives around the world. And, and we're fighting the same fight, Israel and the UK, uh, and Europe and, and the US and the Western world is fighting the same fight against the same enemy. And to me, it's important that we stand with our, our friends uh, and, and oppose, you know, in union, oppose our enemies. I think, that's, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, and I think also in general, I've, I've come to this conclusion in life that when something is true, it has many layers. It has many layers of truth. And it could be true on a biblical plane, on a reconstitution plane. It could have been good for British uh, 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 foreign policy with their strategic global situation. And, it's, and what you're saying is, is another side of it, which is the justice of the Israeli cause and also the, the how, how should we say it in one word, the, the usefulness, the, the, the good, the light that comes out of Israel for the world. It's important to, to, for people that aren't so familiar with it to understand that the Balfour Declaration was fully included into the San Remo Accords, and uh, uh, Arthur James Balfour was actually there uh, in San Remo and making sure that that was going to happen. It was incorporated, the idea that there was going to be a Jewish state, and that happened 100 years ago, really today, 25th of April, 1920, in San Remo, Italy. Uh, and later, two years later, a document was, was formulated, uh, the mandatory document, which is a fabulous document, which recognizes Jewish rights in, in the land of Israel, it doesn't grant, but recognize. It talks about reconstituting, it talks about a right of return, and it also talks about a system by which minorities living in the land will be respected, will have civil rights, uh, will have religious rights, but not necessarily political rights, because the, the folks back then saw that there was gonna be Arab states formed through the mandate, but this one was meant to be a small Jewish state. So it was gonna be strong Arab states, and one small, strong Jewish state, and that's how we were gonna have regional harmony, shall we say, maybe not peace, but harmony. Sadly, uh, that, uh, that attitude did not prevail, but that was the original vision. Can, can, I, can I also, Yeshai, can I, can I make one further point, which sort Please. of complements what you said, which is that um, not only was the, the Balfour Declaration um, made, essentially made part of a legal treaty at San Remo, 
and then in the British mandate or the, 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 the League of Nations mandate for Palestine um, handed to Britain. But also the, 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 the rights of the Jewish people, as well as other pe the Arab peoples in their, in their countries, were enshrined in the Charter of the United Nations when the United Nations was first found. So the legal rights of the Jewish people to, to, to their own homeland in the land of Palestine, now called Israel, um, and then called Israel as well, but, uh, but you know, that, uh, more widely known as Palestine by then, um, is, is, is not just a, some anachronism from history, it was, it was enshrined in the UN Charter. Um, and of course, you know, it's since then, it, obviously, after, you know, after the, um, the, the mandate was given to the UK, we said we weren't going particularly to speak about this, but I'll just mention it. After the mandate was given to the UK, the UK reneged on that mandate. And why did the UK renege on it? Because the UK come in, came under enormous pressure from the Arab population in the Middle East uh, to restrict Jewish immigration or even prevent any Jewish immigration into the land. And Britain succumbed to that pressure, I'm afraid to say. Churchill hated it. Churchill stood up against the government as it, as it sort of caved into this Arab pressure. Um, but, it, but it maintained and it, was, it persisted right the way through. That same pressure and Britain's same policies um, persisted right the way through until the, um, the War of Independence in 1948 and even beyond then. But I'm very pleased to say that today, I think, Britain has a, um, you know, has in, in many ways, certainly officially in, in terms of the government, has restored its previous stance towards Israel. We are, we are, you know, I'd say Britain and Israel, apart from maybe Britain and the US, we are two of the closest allies. And it's, it's, it's based partly on trade and economy, partly on military and intelligence cooperation. I don't think there's any closer intelligence allies in the world than, than Britain and Israel, the United States, etc. Um, so, it, you know, it's, it's, a, um, it, 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 it's, it's often below the radar horizon because of the political sensitivities shameful though that is to say um of uh of um uh of openly and, and positively supporting and backing israel i do believe that that's going to get even better it's good at the moment i think it's going to get even better as britain uh, completely leaves the eu when we're 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 able to shrug off the um the, the you know the the eu's over overwhelming anti-israel stance uh, and hopefully revert to being you know, again, the people that led, directly led, I think, to the recreation of the State of Israel, as I mentioned, by through both the Balfour Declaration in 1917 and the destruction of the Ottoman Empire in 1917, 1918. And I think, you know, I started off by saying, I think that the, the military campaign by Lord, Allen, by Lord Allenby in 1917-18 was, was at least as significant as Balfour Declaration. The reason I say that is because if he hadn't defeated the Turks um, in the land of Palestine, then why would they not still be running it today? Why would they still not be there today? And if they were still running it, would there have been a Jewish state recreated? The answer, of course, is a very resounding no. Well, you're absolutely right. And I want to, you know, I, I honor you as, as a kind of emissary of that way of uh, thinking and acting all the way from, from General Allenby to, to yourself, to Boris Johnson. And uh, yes, we, 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 there were also dark periods, but today we celebrate the great periods. And today we're celebrating 72 years of, uh, of Israeli independence, Jewish independence in the land of Israel, and also 100 years since the San Remo Accords, which brought the Balfour Declaration out of just British, pol British uh, uh, like policy. And it was, it, was, it was even less than policy. It was like a, 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 a kind of position paper into international law and really began the process of reconstitu reconstituting the Jewish people in the land of Israel. Colonel Richard Kemp, you're a great fighter around the world for British interests, but you've also been a great fighter for justice and within that, the cause of Israel. I wanna thank you and wish you a happy Yom Atzmaut. Thank you very much, it's a great pleasure. Great pleasure speaking to you. I hope to see you soon in the promised land. That's right, as we say, next year in person, right? <laughs> I hope this year. <laughs> very good. Richard, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much, Ishai. All right, and we are joined by Jake Bennett, who is the Director of State Legislative Affairs at the Israeli-American Coalition for Action. 
He's also a guy who uh, served in the IDF and a special, special uh, forces unit, one of the best ones in the country. And he's also a good friend, Jake. So great to see you all the way from Phoenix. Thanks, Yashai. Great to talk to you. Jake, I want to also wish you a very happy 72nd Yom Ha'atzmaut Israel Independence Day. Thank you very much to you, too. You, this you is know, one of my favorite holidays. T- tell me a little bit. You, you served in, in, in an amazing unit in the Israeli army. Uh, you work in uh, pro-Israel advocacy and activism and legislation uh, and pro-Jewish legislation uh, around the United States. Tell me how, how 72nd, 72nd year of Israel's independence feels to you this year. Uh, Yom Ha'atzmaut, Israeli Independence Day, feels to me like a combination of July 4th and, uh, and Passover, Pesach, because you've got that element of the, uh, of the political freedom and then the, the history of the Jewish people, the national gula, the redemption, uh, the coming back to the land of Israel, which this year uh, the calendar worked out that Pesach was actually very close uh, to uh, Israeli Independence Day. Um, and you have, as, uh, as you mentioned, Yom HaZikaron and, and Yom HaShoah. So, so this is a day that, that to me is, is, uh, is, is really a, a redemptive happy day that also brings, uh, brings together all of that Jewish history, um, 2,000 years of exile, uh, the Shoah where my, my grandmother was a, a slave to the Nazis in the, in the death camps uh, but survived and my grandpa hid out in the woods. Um, and, uh, and, and a generation before that, Jews were dealing with pogroms in, in Eastern Europe and starting to, to rebuild the land to restore Jewish sovereignty. And here we are. So uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful day, always a little bittersweet. The, the Yom HaShoah and Yom HaZikaron leading into it really, really makes us appreciate, um, as we should, the, the, the magnificence of, uh, of the time that we're living in, um, in all of Israel's wars. And, and the and the incredible that, that and the incredible self sacrifice of our yeah. parents, our grandparents, and friends, and and this year Yom Hazikaron, I remember Ari Fold, uh, a buddy, and and also a, a great warrior for Israel on every front, and so you know I remember one of my commanders in the army who was killed, Tom Karin, he was killed in an action with uh, in a in a, uh, a battle with Hezbollah in 1996. So I remember all those folks and, and, and others. Uh, and so you're right, it is, it's bitter, it's very, very sweet, but we remember the bitterness of l- losing friends and comrades. And we, of course, remember the Shoah. What people don't know is that 100 years ago this week <clears throat> in San Remo, Italy, the powers that got together, that defeated the uh, Ottoman Turks and the other members of the Axis, uh, the allies got together and decided what they're gonna do with the remnants of the Ottoman Empire. And uh, on April 25th, they decided to incorporate, April 25th, 1920, they decided to incorporate uh, the Balfour Declaration of 1917 into uh, a new system that was gonna be called the Mandates, in which the European powers, the French and the, and the, and the English, and the British were going to uh, rule different parts of the Middle East with the hopes of mentoring these, these places, these countries now uh, into self, uh, self-governing, strong, independent states. Amongst them was going to be Palestine. Palestine was going to, of course, be Jewish Palestine, a, a Jewish state. And that was decided on, on April 25th, 1920, that they were going to incorporate the Balfour Declaration. They were going to make sure there was going to be a Jewish state. And maybe that was one of the greatest moments uh, of uh, the, the, big, the, the foundational moment of international law, of, of the Jewish state in international law. And what we're gonna read now is we're gonna read a document that was finished off about two years after that, um, that was there to complete the idea that happened at San Remo, that there was gonna be a mandatory uh, for a Jewish state. Uh, and so in 1922, they got together two years later and wrote up a document uh, to, to crystallize what a Jewish state, what the process of creating a Jewish state was gonna look like. Is that a good summary, Jake? That sounds good to me, yeah. All right, so let's go to the text. I'm going to use our, our handy-dandy uh, screen share here. Tell me where I should go. Let's go to the preamble. All right. And, uh, and let's start at the second paragraph uh, that starts with, whereas the principal allied powers. And uh, I'll just read those two paragraphs because that gets us started. All right. Whereas the principal allied powers. Are you there? Yep, I'm with you. 
Okay. Whereas the principal allied powers have also agreed that the mandatory should be responsible for putting into effect the declaration originally made on November 2nd, 1917 by the government of his Britannic Majesty and adopted by the said powers in favor of the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, it being clearly understood that nothing should be done which might prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. And whereas recognition has thereby been given to the historical connection of the Jewish people with Palestine and to the grounds for reconstituting their national home in that country. So there we have some key ideas, the historical connection of the Jewish people with Palestine and reconstituting their national home. Right. So, so the, 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 the importance of that is that they're not granting Israel any um, right that didn't exist beforehand. They are there to recognize the Jewish kind of natural rights or self-determination rights, which was the language of Woodrow Wilson at that period, right? So they're here to recognize the Jews have always been connected to this place and they're going to reconstitute. What, what is this reconstitution? It's the reconstitution of two commonwealths that existed beforehand, and now there's going to be a third one. And so right. the language of international law is not of granting, <clears throat> not of dividing, not of doing anybody any favors. It's like, you guys have a natural connection to this land, a natural history to, to, in this land, and so we're going to recognize that and help reconstitute that. That is an incredible language that is so missing in today's discourse. Am I right, Jake? Yeah, absolutely. There was, a, there was an important letter by Churchill, who was the, uh, um, uh, who played an important role in, in, this, uh, in this period about a, a month earlier, where he said it's essential that the Jewish people should know that it is in Palestine as of right and not on sufferance that the Jewish people have a right to be there. They're not there because some people are doing them a favor. They're not allowed to be there because some people are doing a favor. They're allowed to be there because they have a right. And that's that, a that, key right, that, concept. That, right, and, and, and this idea that you have a natural, organic connection to this land. You have your history here. And, and what we're facing today, if only that paragraph could be uh, made part of the general discourse today, which is, which, which is we're going to recognize your historical rights and we're going to reconstitute, help reconstitute a state that you've already had. There is no Arab Palestine in these places. Uh, we have not stolen anybody else's land. We have a natural connection to this land. And we're certainly not white Europeans who came in and stole somebody else's land. We are the indigenous people of this place. And so it was recognized. It's important to understand that 1920, uh, I think there were four powers, four allied powers that, that got together, and it was Japan, Russia, uh, the UK, and France. Uh, but here, this mandatory was ratified by 56 members unanimously of the League of Nations. So we're talking about full international law that was uh, uh, accepted by, by the whole international community of that time. And later, when the United Nations was was formed, it accepted all the decisions that the League of Nations took beforehand. So this is the real controlling international law. And this document is the real, it's the real, remember that old commercial, where's the beef? Here's the beef. Okay, this is the real stuff uh, of, of the, the underpinnings of the Jewish state. Let's get to the next text. What should we read? Yeah, um, let's skip ahead. Uh, Article 2 re, uh, reaffirms that. Um, talks about the establishment of the Jewish national home again, but let's skip ahead to Article 5. All right. Article 5 is very brief. It says, the mandatory shall be responsible for seeing that no Palestine territory shall be ceded or leased to or in any way placed under the control of the government of any foreign power. Okay. That's pretty powerful. Uh, and, and that comes in. Uh, what's the, what's the basic meaning in. of that paragraph? that this land, this whole land that's being recognized as the, as the mandate for a Jewish homeland um, is the Jewish homeland. So we see a lot of challenges to that in the hundred years since. Um, we've seen jihadist challenges on the basis of, uh, of, of Jewish sovereignty not being allowed, uh, racist challenges on the basis that, uh, that uh, Jews are not indigenous as the rest of the world had called them indigenous to this place for 2000 years, but were somehow colonialists and uh, um, 
and we've seen calls for the partition over and over again of the land of Israel. Uh -huh. So this phrase basically says this. Now, you're very good with the numbers. What are we talking about in terms of how much of, of this is the uh, part of the former Turkish Ottoman Empire? So this area was 40,000 square miles. It's the size of Virginia. The, uh, this was 4% of, uh, of the Ottoman Empire. Okay, so um, when it ends up getting broken up uh, by the British and the area east of the Jordan gets, it gets partitioned for the first time, the original two-state solution, and you have Arab Palestine and Jewish Palestine, they give over three quarters, 77% of the land, 30,000 square miles to Arab Palestine. What's left, instead of being the size of Virginia, what's left west of the Jordan River is the size of Maryland. Mm. What happens now, uh, 25 years later, when you get to the UN uh, partition proposal, which was not a binding law, but a proposal, was, um, was a, further, uh, a further partition of that land. What you ended up with um, two years later with armistice lines after Israel's War of Independence was, uh, was minus 20% of that. So Israel becomes, uh, shrinks from the size of Maryland to the size of New Jersey. And those, that area that is, uh, that is the so-called West Bank, known historically as Judea and Samaria, um, that's about 2,000 square miles. The rest of Israel is 8,000 square miles. Those 2,000 square miles, to help people understand what this means, it's the size of three counties in New Jersey or three counties in Maryland. So this, th this article was like, look, this, this is the Jewish homeland. Don't cut it up. Don't give it away at anybody. Don't try to shrink it. This, this is the, 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 the classic land that, was, that belonged to the Jewish people. And so the mandate, let's look at it again. Uh, the, the mandate is supposed to make sure that nobody takes away this land and that they shouldn't cut it up. Now, Jordan, it's a long story about how they were able to cut out Jordan. But the point is, is that anybody today reading this Article 5, the mandatory shall be responsible for seeing that no Palestine, and today you would have to add Jewish Palestine, because people don't understand that the word Palestine is actually, in this case, absolutely, unquestionably, meaning a Jewish-Israeli Palestine. So for seeing that no Palestine territory shall be ceded or leased to, or in any way placed under the control of the government of any foreign power. So you really couldn't be clear that, that, that what is the intent here? The intent here is to keep this place Jewish. Don't cut it up. Somebody's going to come around. Somebody's going to come around and say, hey, this is my land. No. International law recognized this is nobody else's land. And, and I think even in the discourse of the deal of the century, today, it would behoove us to recognize that there should be no discussion, really, of giving away uh, this land to any other foreign power or government. Um, and, and that let's, you know, I, I kind of wish that the deal of the century today would look like the deal of the century a century ago, right? Yeah. Do we the have any other century ago was a pretty good deal. It was a pretty good deal. It was a pretty good deal. It was, you know what, but you, but you know what, Jake, that, that makes me, that makes me want to, want to clarify one thing, which is that it's not a good deal for the Jews and for Israel. It's actually a good day for a good deal for Middle East stability and prosperity. And yeah. the peace plan of 1920 was very simple. Strong Jewish states, excuse me, let me say that again. A strong Jewish state surrounded yes. by strong Arab states. Yeah. And, a, and it was recognized a year earlier at the Treaty of Versailles uh, in the Faisal Weizmann letters, um, where Chaim Weizmann uh, of, the, of the Zionist organization had met with the Emir Faisal, who was to be the leader of, uh, of Syria in this post-war world, who said, as long as the Arabs get our independent states, I'm happy and fine with the Jews having their state. Right. They belong there anyway. They're going right. to bring the best scientists. Uh, I mean, it's a beautiful letter. You've read it. Uh, they're going to develop this, this state, and they're going to develop the region, and we're going to grow strong and, and uh, together. And that was a beautiful concept. And the idea that, um, that you could have Arab, uh, Arab strength and independence in all the Arab lands and Jewish strength and independence and, and be friends and Abrahamic uh, uh, cousins and, and, um, and partnership was an idea that, uh, 
that could have taken off, but uh, we know where the world's gone in the last hundred right. years. But 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 what a simple and it still could. What a, right, exactly? What a simple outlook. This is a region of ethnic national states. That's not a bad word. It's a nice word. And in the twenties, it was certainly seen as a nice word. You have an ethnic national Jewish state, ethnic national Arab states, a Semitic region, an Abrahamic union, and they're all strong and doing their thing. Nobody's trying to, and we'll get to this in a second, nobody's trying to get rights to undermine uh, the Arab nature of the countries around us. No, no Jews are trying to vote out the Arabs in their states, and no Arabs are trying to vote out the Jews in their state. This is tribal regional lands. This is the Jewish protectorate. These are the Arab areas. And, and, and that's how we're going to get along, by that understanding, by that respect. And, and the clear-eyed time that, of the 20s, where it was like they were post-World War I, uh, they wanted a world that was going to be stable. It didn't work out for them, but they had a clear-eyed vision of, of how, to, how to put these powers in consonance with one another. One more thing, uh, T.E. Lawrence, the famous Lawrence of Arabia, he orchestrated the Arab revolt against the Turks, and he basically said to the Arabs, you're going to get liberty, you're going to get these Turks off your back, and you're going to get regional self-determination. That's the same thing he thought about the Jews. He yes. thought the Arabs were going to get self-determination, great. And the mm -hmm. Jews, which is basically another type of Arab tribe, a Semitic tribe right next door to the Arabs from the same type yeah. of family, they too are going to get their self-determination. And these these peoples are going to get states and they're going to be living in liberty without the yoke of the of the uh backwards uh, ottoman rule so that that was the and vision of the time absolutely and at the time to put it in context this was the liberal vision because remember what preceded it what preceded it was spheres of influence conquest colonialism and then you had this concept of these ethno-national states of indigenous independence T.E. Lawrence and Amir Faisal went to Versailles and joined Chaim Weizmann in convincing some British foreign office uh, uh, people who were against this idea of Jewish independence that no, this makes sense. T.E. Lawrence was on board, Faisal was on board. Um, and, 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 and recall that in this document, and, and we can get to this, but there is a, there's also another very liberal idea, which is that there would be civil and religious liberties for everybody in the land. Well, let's get to it. Let's get to that right now. Let me share my screen. Where are we going to? Which? Uh, well, let's see. Next, uh, before where's we the get to that, where's the let's article get about? To the, uh, let's go. Yeah. Go ahead. You want to jump to the civil liberties? Yeah. I, I just want to get to. In, I, in, I, I, I want to. I want to make the point that we're making right now, which is, which is that 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 for for non uh, non uh, uh, non Jews living in the land, there was going to be uh, an anchoring of civil and religious freedoms uh, and rights, but that is as opposed to uh, national rights, meaning to say you're going to have mm -hmm. civil liberties you're going to have the right to congregate and say whatever you want, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and you're going to have your rights to religion, but you're not going to be able to vote in that Jewish country because we don't want to give you the right to vote out the Jews in their small protectorate. And that's probably what was envisioned for the, in the Arab states as well. And it was just clear, clear eyed. So the Jews, you're going to control this area. You're going to rule it. You're going to have minorities. You got to treat them right. But that doesn't mean that you got to give them the, the driver's seat to try to take over the country or in other words. And here's, here's the important point for today. Israel is not Jewish because it's a Jewish majority. It's not Jewish because democratically speaking, it's a majority of Jews in the land. Israel is Jewish and was envisioned to be Jewish when the Jews were still a minority. Uh, yeah. there, were, there were more Arabs in the land than Jews, but it was still understood that this is a Jewish state. Uh, today, thankfully, the situation is, has been reversed and we have you know, a lot more Jews than Arabs, which, which you know, is good because this is the national home of the Jews, but, but that's not the reason that Israel is a Jewish state. And I think that's in the, right. in the text. Can we see that? Uh, yeah, bear with me to, to refine that. Right, so we are talking about, uh, I, think, I think we have it in the preamble 
it's, it's right in the preamble. It says, it being clearly understood mm. that nothing should be done which might prejudice the civil and religious rights yes. of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. Right. And interestingly and enough- And again in Article 2, it's reiterated in Article 2. Let's see that again. Yeah. And also safeguarding Article 2 of, and, and we're, now let's just make it clear what we're talking about. We're talk, this, this is a text that was finished off in, in 1922. This is the mandate uh, for Palestine which was based on San Remo, which happened this week, 100 years ago, uh, April 25th, uh, 1920. And it says, and also for safeguarding the civil and religious rights of all the inhabitants of Palestine, irrespective of race and religion. So civil and religious rights, certainly, but not democratic voting rights, democratic liberties, but not necessarily yeah. democratic voting rights. Right because it, it could have uh, challenged the, the very Jewish immigration that this Jewish national home was, uh, um, was to be based on. And, and there we get to, to Article 6, um, where we, if you want to pull that up. I'm pulling it up right now. Let's get to Article 6. Go ahead. Article 6. The administration of Palestine, while ensuring that the rights and position of other sections of the population are not prejudiced, shall facilitate Jewish immigration under suitable conditions and shall encourage in cooperation with the Jewish agency referred to in Article 4, close settlement by Jews on the land, including state lands and wastelands not required for public purposes. All right. So what you have there is uh, another element that gets challenged in the world today, in the anti-Israel world today, the law of return. Uh, the law of return, which is a concept that's applied in many European countries, in many democracies. Uh, in law, it has a, it has a term, jus sanguinis, which means that by virtue of your heritage, you have a right to citizenship in this place. And here the, the international uh, world, the League of Nations recognized that Jews had been recognized for 2000 years as coming from this place and had a right to be in this place, to get citizenship in this place and immigrate to this place. And there was, a, um, there was an anti-Jewish immigration movement at the time from people who didn't want the, the Jewish state. But an important thing to note is that at the same time that Jews were moving in to build the country, you had Arabs moving in from all around the region. Um, so you had Arab population growing, uh, it, growing dramatically while uh, the Jewish population was growing. So it's not that, that these immigrants were taking away jobs and opportunity, um, they were creating jobs and opportunity. That's right. Uh, the, the, the Jewish state is, is actually one of the main sources uh, of work and prosperity uh, for local Arabs and could be also a great partner for regional prosperity if the jihad would, uh, would kind of evaporate and instead a, a spirit of cooperation, um, a spirit of the Abrahamic Union, the Semitic Union would take place, the spirit that we saw uh, that Emir Faisal had, and many Arabs that I know, many so-called Palestinians that I know, who wish to see that day where Israel will be sovereign in its land, where there'll be residents of Israel with upward mobility, with prosperity, with opportunity, um, and that Arab countries around us would be our natural trade partners. I want to wish you uh, an amazing Yom Atzmaut. Thank you for being a fighter for Israel in, in every way, uh, including being uh, a super soldier here in the land of Israel, uh, and also today being the Director of State Legislative Affairs for the Israeli-American Coalition for Action, which is just such an awesome, awesome job. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Yishev. Thank you for everything that you do. It's a pleasure to be on the show. Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach to you. Later. All right, we want to welcome Rabbi Mike Foyer, who's an educator, a counselor, and also the creator of a history podcast called The Jewish Story on the Land of Israel Network. He's a history buff and a great teacher uh, and also an awesome rabbi. Uh, rabbi Mike Foyer, first thing, Chag uh, Happy Israel Independence Day. And also, yeah, I just want to ask you about like a spiritual perspective. Like, how do we look at this crazy thing where we had nations uh, beforehand, like the Romans and others, crusaders and Muslims, uh, um, uh, coming into our land, occupying it, uh, taking away our sovereignty, destroying our sovereignty. And here you had the world gathering together saying, hey, Jews, we recognize 
that this is your homeland? How do we see that in historical, spiritual perspective? Well, first of all, I mean, after a rough couple of millennia, we see it as Chaz de Hashem. We really see it um, as the grace of God and, and uh, as, a, as a confirmation that a promise remains unbroken. Um, it, and that's an important perspective because it was not a simple process and we're not even at a point in that process. But I would say is if you pull back a little bit further, that what comes to my mind when you want to talk about the spiritual perspective of San Remo is what are known as the three oaths which I'm guessing you're familiar with, but for anyone who may be watching who's not, you, if you look at the end of the Gemara and Ketubot, you'll find an Agadita, right? This narrative sort of, not just storytelling portion of the Gemara, but, but exploration of thought, where the rabbis say that Israel was bound into exile with three oaths, which means that there's a whole world which comes into being around the destruction of the Second Temple that we've lived in since then. And those three oaths are number one, Shelo Yalu Kechoma, right? That Am Yisrael shouldn't come up en masse as a wall, literally. And um, it's generally understood that that means that we're not supposed to fight our way into the land. So, so the, the Jews are not one, supposed to, the Jews aren't supposed to come in and, and bowl through, like come in on a, on a huge army and just take it over in strength. That's a, that's an oath that we are kind of, that we somehow accepted, says the Talmud, right? Okay. Well, whether we accept it or not, I mean, when God <clears throat> binds you with an oath, it's kind of, you know, um, non-consensual or not. So, okay. but, but it, and it's a reference, if people are familiar with the history, to the fact that um, at the turn of a different era between the destruction of the first temple and the construction of the second, the end of the Babylonian exile, um, there was a criticism of the Jews who didn't come up Kichoma, right? We didn't come up en masse. Most of the Jews remained in Babylon. So apparently that was an opportunity to repeat that sort of Joshua-like conquest. Once the second temple is destroyed and the great exile that we still are struggling to leave completely now comes into being. So that's one of the O's. That method is off the table. The second one is uh, not to rebel against the nations, right? And, and this goes to the heart of the rabbinic conception of what history basically is frankly, since the destruction of the first temple. We have to remember that, that sovereignty, the idea of kingship, that someone not only makes the rules, but holds the context that allows the world really to develop its relationships. Sovereignty for Am Yisrael finds its fullest expression in a society that is able to bring the presence of God back to earth, right? The temple in its fullness, the Shekhinah, God's presence dwelling, that has not existed in the world since the destruction of the first temple. And if you open up the book of Daniel, you'll see there at the second chapter a vision of what it looks like when sovereignty was taken away from Am Yisrael, when the hope that there could be a kingdom of flesh and blood that could actually represent the kingdom of God in the world. It was taken away and it was given over to the nations who may be just, may not. They may be good, they may not. But what they don't have is the capacity to represent the kingdom of God on earth. That was taken away and will return in some visionary time. And, and because of that, sovereignty belongs to the nation. So the sages said, we're, we're bound not to rebel. I mean, you know, we say dina de mafuta dina, right? Mm -hmm. Law of the king is indeed the law. The third oath is... Um, so we have to, bound, so in, yeah. in short, we have to accept the, the, the yoke of the nations. We can't rebel against yeah. them and say, I'm not listening to you anymore. They have some say in the matter. And until we have kind of a green light, we can't go to the land of Israel. Uh, it's deeper than in, say. In rebellion. I would say it's deeper than say. They are the context for the world right now. Mm -hmm. The world, and, and that's why San Remo is so important. Because don't forget that like the San Remo agreement, as you pointed out, sort of lay at the base of the entire League of Nations process, which itself eventually grew into the United Nations, which means the entire concept of international law, of international sovereignty, that, that the world is a grouping of nation states who relate to each other as equals, despite the very obvious disparities in power and economics, et cetera. That concept of national self-determination lays at the base of the current context of society. And right there at the base is the fact that the Jewish people have a right to be sovereign in our land. Right? It's a recognition that we, despite our dispersed nature and our difficult history, belong in our land just as much as the Mesopotamians belong in theirs. So the third oath, just to get the complete picture, is that the nations actually was not just binding on Israel, but on the nations, that the nations shouldn't depress Israel too much. You know, and we happen to be recording this on Yom HaShoah, so for me, it's always a little bit of a bitter pill. Like, what does it mean they shouldn't uh, subjugate us too much? Well, we know now. They may not right. have known before this. You might have thought 
at different times, the Inquisition or the Crusades or whatever, that that was too much. No, we, we know what too much is now. Okay, so you have, these, you have these three oaths. The first one is don't bowl your way into the land of Israel. The second one, don't rebel against the yoke of other nations. And the third is actually an oath on the nations. Don't torment the Jews too much. Too much. One, one can argue that those three oaths have somehow been uh, unlocked. Okay, maybe uh, the Jewish people did not go up in, 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 in kind of a, in strength and a massive force, but came in drop by drop into the land of Israel until they grew more and more. Two is that the, the nations, instead of causing us to rebel against them, basically gave a green light, a recognition, not a granting, but a recognition of Jewish rights in the land of Israel. Uh, and thirdly, the Holocaust is a, um, how should we say, uh, an abrogation. Uh, of of the, the 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 prohibition against torturing the Jewish people, they just overdid it, and so and so all of those are kind of green lights for the Jewish people to 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 return to the land of Israel. Yeah, That's a, that, it's a it's a shifting in the whole context of exile toward it's a turning of the corner, if you will, toward redemption. Mm. That's very That's powerful. How I and, think of it, and and it's been like a, it's been a hundred years. I think the things that there's something powerful mm -hmm. about that, like a hundred years. It's been a hundred years since that decision. Um, sadly, though, I guess the, the only question mark that's out there is after San Remo, uh, the British themselves, who were the mandatory, they were the ones that were supposed to be responsible to basically tutor uh, Israel and other countries into, into, into freedom, into self-determination, started turning their back on the Jews. And the UN, which is the inheritor of the League of Nations, instead of going in the pathway of Balfour, and the San Remo Accords turned a direction and went the other way. I told my wife that this is a little bit like Egypt when when the when the Pharaoh, when Pharaoh finally released the Jews into into the Exodus into into leaving Egypt. Suddenly turns around and says, "Wait a minute, what have we done?" Wait. Right, and we got we got to chase them and stop this process. Of course, the process is once it's out the door, it's not stopping anywhere. But I guess that's a, that's a little question mark of of why have they why have the nations reneged? on that beautiful, beautiful moment. And, and I just want, want to add one more point, which is the, the founders of, uh, of the Balfour Declaration, if it was D David Lloyd George, if it was Balfour himself and many people around that, they were very sad to see uh, England and, and uh, this whole process start to going, going the other way. And the people that took over for them in the British government were not people of the Bible. Uh, as these Balfour Declaration people were, and they were not people that saw the great opportunity to reinstate, reinvigorate the Jewish people in the land of Israel, re-embody the Jewish people in the land of Israel. And so, and so it was like a beautiful moment 100 years ago. There were even Arab factions uh, head, headed by Emir Faisal, uh, who met with Chaim Weizmann, exchanged beautiful letters, uh, and, and really saw, to quote Shimon Peres, like a new Middle East. Uh, and, and somehow that was um, some, somehow that was. Even Paris was there at the Paris conference. Was <laughs> <laughs> That's a good joke. Um, um, but 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 there are these moments of of beauty, and somehow somehow they they were lost, and from then on we actually had to fight for it. So how do you explain that in the context of what you said? <sighs> well, you have to remember that the Paris Peace Conference in San Remo came in the wake of World War I, which was really conceived of as the war to end all wars. It was more horrific than anyone had ever imagined. Um, it was also, in many ways, um, almost an accidental war. I mean, I mean, true that very few wars are really premeditated on that scale. But it, there was a, a sense in which a, a world system had grown up organically, which was completely unstable. When it broke down, it exploded in a way that no one expected. And therefore, in the aftermath, it was an opportunity to take those lessons to heart, right? Woodrow Wilson's vision of national self-determination was a very important part of that. This sort of sense that humanity had a unique opportunity to reorder the world, you know, to borrow the phrase from Isaiah, to beat their swords into plowshares and really end war. But what happened was that needs a narrative. If you're going to do something like that, you need some vision because it's going to demand a lot of things. It's going to demand a lot of growth and change. It's going to demand a new way of organizing. It's going to demand something like breaking up the world empires, not for your own self-interest, but for the interests of the peoples there. But instead, what emerged out of it, as you're pointing out, was a new power game. You know, Britain wasn't prepared to give up its colonial power. Neither was France. Neither was Germany even once they recovered from 
the beating that they'd taken and the very fact that they didn't finish the job and left Germany unconquered in World War I in many ways led directly to the resurgence and World War II. So, but what I would say is that, is that the difference between, say, 1920 and 1947, between what I've heard you call the, the San Remo narrative and the United Nations narrative, Right? And there are many differences, but one of them is that by 1947, the experience of the people around the tables there was um, the gates of Auschwitz and the mushroom cloud over Hiroshima. They no longer had the faith that the world was going to be a better place. They were just trying to clean up as much of the mess as they could and feeling a tremendous guilt over the fact that they had allowed the things that had occurred to happen. Mm. Right? And whereas there was a sense of almost messianic hopefulness that surrounded San Remo. And there was also one other element, I think, which is very important, and that is the element of uh, the Bible. The Bible was an important player in the minds of the, of the, of the people that, that uh, wrote and disseminated the, the Balfour Declaration. They, they really lived with the, with the Bible. I read that, that uh, Lord uh, James Arthur Balfour, he was uh, uh, schooled by his mom, and she read them from the Bible every single night, and when he was at San Remo, he kept on saying to them, well, how I envision the map of Israel is from Dan to Beersheba. Okay, he really saw, uh, and he's, that phrase was a recurring phrase in his, in his lips. Sure. He even said at some point that he understood the, the British position uh, uh, in the uh, Holy Land better the, than he understood it in various places in Europe and, and in various, you know, uh, various battlefields. So the, the Bible played a, a major role uh, at the UN and maybe on today's campus and in other places, maybe at CNN and, and the New York Times, the Bible doesn't, doesn't play so much of a role. People don't feel themselves to be characters in the Bible. People don't feel themselves that the Jews are the heroes of the story, that Israel is rightful in the hands of Israel. So, so we, we've, we've, it's, a, it's a bit of paradise lost, right? Because you, you kind of, or, or I like to say paradigm lost. There's a certain paradigm uh, that got lost and, uh, and, and, and it, it hasn't really come back yet, except for, interestingly, amongst Jewish people themselves, I think there is a resurgence in a connection to the Bible, either within a sense of tradition or maybe a sense of, of a real religion, like a sense of serving God, or like, uh, or like Ben Gurion, who saw it as a book of history that guided us to where we're from and where we're going. Yeah. And I, I I like the image of paradigm lost because in many ways it wasn't just a paradigm lost. It was all paradigms lost. And that's really the difference. San Remo was the height of the modern era where the hopefulness of the power that humanity could wield both on a moral and a technological and political front had not been overwhelmed by the horror of war, but actually in many ways it had convinced people that now was the time to act. And that was what the attempt was made. Whereas by 1947 and certainly today, that hopefulness is gone. The idea that there's a story, like you're saying, that, that the biblical narrative is a meta-narrative for, for humanity, that the Bible can be um, sort of a scaffolding to build a better world beyond sort of the classically religious perspective or beyond the historical perspective, that it actually contains a wisdom, be it in the book of Daniel, be it in the five books of the Torah, wherever you see it, that it contains a wisdom that will allow us to build a better world, that Israel is a hero of a story. There are no heroes in the postmodern right. era. Right. They're only well, victims and perpetrators. Right. To the, to the They're victims. only victims and perpetrators. A hero is just, listen, it's important to understand this because <laughs> our claim to heroism, a hero is just a perpetrator with better PR. And that's <laughs> what you get out of the campus response to the biblical narrative today. Oh, you Jews aren't different or better. You're just using the Bible to cover up you're evil. You're actually Nazis on the inside, just like everybody else. And sadly, you know, there, we feel that sometimes within ourselves. But the reality is, is that every biblical hero is flawed and struggles with the question of power, right? That doesn't mean they're not heroic. Right. And I think that that's a lot of what's been lost. Yeah. Well, I, I think that, that on the one hand, it's been lost. Uh, but on the other hand, we do see um, a moment where for the last 72 years, today we're, we're celebrating Israel Independence Day, we have seen a tremendously heroic moment. Yes, there's elements that try to erode that, but we are going to be celebrating. I think the people in the state of Israel are going to be celebrating. I think Jews and lovers of Israel throughout, throughout the world are celebrating. I think they're celebrating with us right now uh, on, this, on this video. And I just wanted to, sure. to finish off with you, Rabbi Mike Foyer, and kind of ask you, uh, how do you... How do you celebrate this day? Like, what, 
what is its meaning to you, especially the confluence uh, of both Israel Independence Day uh, together with, um, with 100 years since San Remo. Uh, it's, it's this year, 72 is a beautiful number, 100 is a beautiful number. Like, how, how do you understand Yom Ha'atzmaut, this Israel Day of Independence? So Yom Ha'atzmaut, when, the first thing that always comes to my mind when I think about it is the name itself. I, mean, I love the Hebrew language. It's a language that, um, you know, we're taught that it was actually the, the means by which God creates the world. And therefore, it's always worth it to delve into the nature of a word. And, you know, independence is not a particularly Jewish concept. It's important to remember that. Is that we are a people who are meant to express God's sovereignty in the world. And not just in the sense that we all are an expression of the divine will, but, but also we're people for whom the collective, that Am Yisrael, really takes a center stage and that each of us as individuals, of course, is precious and important in the whole world, but that we're meant to be expressive of and to serve the mission of that collective. So independence is a, is a dicey word. Atzma'ut, in many ways, is a much more profound and more Jewish concept because etzem, of course, is the, the thing itself. It's the nature of thing. Atzma'ut is self-actualization. This is a day of self-actualization. And that's, I think, where Yom Atzmut and San Remo really come so beautifully together. Because what the nations did is recognize that, especially men like Lord Balfour, eh, they, they, because of their religious and biblical vision, that what the world needed was a platform to be able to take it to the next level of expression and actualization. And that's the role of Am Yisrael. It's the role of the Jewish people. We're meant to serve. We're meant to serve God. We're meant to serve the world. And of course, to serve also our national interests. And the beauty is that none of those contradict. But it only works. You know, the expression that Archimedes said, if you give me a lever and where to stand, I'll move the world. But well, we as a people, the Torah is our lever. The land of Israel is where we're meant to stand. And our mission is to actually move the world. So that's really what I see in the sense that we've been gifted with a return to our land and the opportunity to sort of regroup and recoalesce here as a people in a way in which we haven't been able to do for a couple of thousand years. And the only other thing I would add to that is it's very important to me on the day itself to spend a little bit of time feeling the dream. That we're living the dream of 2,000 years. And not just from the sense of privilege and uh, I don't want to feel guilty, the survivor's guilt, but just, just simply the, the joy and wonder of it. Because right. reality is national life is messy. It's complicated. I have to tell you, you know probably better than me, you know, if that's even possible, how messy our situation is. But you know what? It's a blessing. And even the problems we have are problems of blessing today. And so it's a day in which to feel the fact that we're living the dream of 2,000 years and to rejoice at the opportunity to be able to actualize ourselves as individuals, as a people, and ultimately in service of the divine vision for humanity as a whole in a way which we could not do for millennia. And we have been given a great gift, and I really appreciate spending time with you talking about that amazing gift. It, it really is. My it's it's it, it, we we've spent a lot of words on it, but in in many ways it's ineffable. It's it's there's there's no words for it. The the grand the massiveness uh, of this incredible time, this incredible uh, gift of being that generation that is getting to be reembodied in the land of Israel and really fulfilling that 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 great dream of two thousand years that those those dreams of all the individuals and God's dream as well. Rabbi Mike Foyer, you're both a rabbi, you're on the faculty of the uh, Pardes Institute, uh, you're a counselor, uh, a lot of people come to you for, for, for help, and also you're a teacher through your uh, history podcast called The Jewish Story, found at jewishstory.co and on the Land of Israel Network. Thank you so much for being with us today. It was my pleasure, thank you. Hey folks, thanks so much for joining me on the broadcast. We went back 100 years, all the way to April 25th, 1920, to San Remo, Italy, to learn about the origins of Israel's rights in international law. In preparation for the show, I was aided by two books. One was The Jewish People's Rights to the Land of Israel by Salman Ben Zimra and put out by our friends, Canadians for Israel's Legal Rights. It's a great book, and this is actually a draft copy handed to me by Solomon himself. He later passed away, so this show is dedicated to his memory. And also the Balfour Declaration by Elliot Yeager. A great book, amazing story about the people behind this incredible miracle of the recognition of the rights of Jewish people to reconstitute their state in the land of Israel. So thank you very much for being with me and celebrating 100 years of international law rights and 72 years of independence. God bless you from the land of Israel, from the land of blessings. See you again on this awesome journey of the Jewish people's return to the land. Shalom.